All right, everyone, welcome to Conversations in Horror. My name is Kevin L. Powers, and I'm your host for this show, uh, but I have some special guests with me to discuss this amazing movie that we are going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we have Jim Adams and Thomas Tenorello. They're going to be with me, and they're going to discuss why they love the movie House of a Thousand Corpses from Rob Zombie more than I do. Uh, <laughs> Jim, <laughs> uh, tell all of, of my audience exactly a little bit about yourself. You want me first? Yep. Yeah, well, I'm, I am the host of uh, the Monster Attack podcast. Uh, we're in our eighth season right now, a weekly podcast talking about being a monster kid and all the great monster movies we grew up with and the experiences it had for us. Um, I've been into, I've been into monsters, uh, you know, since I was six, six, seven years old. So uh, of all genres, you know, now Monster Attack deals more with the stuff that I grew up with. Uh, you know, fa more family friendly stuff, but uh, you know, but I, but I love all all of the different horror genres. So um, this is one that uh, this particular movie we're going to talk about this evening is it almost in a genre to itself. It almost started a new genre back in in two thousand and three. So uh, looking forward to this one. It uh, I've had some interesting experiences with it. Okay, uh, <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell everyone a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, well, before I get into that, Jim, I, I did not know you had a podcast. I would love to be on your show because that sounds. Uh, I, too, am a monster kid. Grew up. Uh, <laughs> There's a in, lot of us out there. Yeah, there yeah. is. <laughs> although although I, I think I'm I'm a little bit younger than you in the sense that I grew up on. Uh, well, you probably did grow up on Godzilla as well. I grew up. Oh, on absolutely. Godzilla. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and Monster Squad uh, kind of introduced me to the Universal Monsters. And I was hooked ever since. Nice. That. Nice. And uh, we. Um, and uh, and I think I kind of transitioned to some of the more modern stuff after I saw uh, Michael Jackson's Thriller, oh, yeah. and <laughs> that was my first exposure to zombies. And that's kind of my favorite subgenre. I think right now is zombie movies. Um, and uh, and Gremlins, of course, was like I think it was like my first gateway horror because it's it's kids, <laughs> but also terrifying. Um, oh yeah. Uh, so I've I've since um, become a screenwriter. Um, part-time uh, podcaster, filmmaker, um, uh, and uh, for, a, for, a, for a very brief, very, very brief uh, period of time, I was a, uh, 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 my, my brain just had a fart. An actor? I'll, I'll let, no, well, not really an actor. I was an extra, but I was going to say production assistant on um, uh, Walking Dead. So that's oh, okay. the most uh, physically demanding thing I've ever had to do. <laughs> And honestly, that's a whole other like podcast episode in and of itself. All the uh, the terror <laughs> at Walking Dead. Not to say anything bad about any of the creative people behind it, because I love Greg Nicotero and all those guys. But yeah, I did not get to meet him either. But I almost did. Nice but guy. I, I I hear so many great things, but I chickened out. He just like walked past me, and I was like, ah. <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> My, also, because also is also like my favorite. If people if you ask me, what is your favorite um, horror movie for the longest time? I could not give them an answer. But la this year, when I uh, made my uh, my list on uh, Letterbox, which by the way, if all of y'all don't have a Letterbox, you should get a Letterbox uh, uh, profile so that all of our audiences can follow us. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, but uh, but my I made my list, and uh, Evil Dead Two came to the top. So oh, nice, singing. nice choice. Yeah. Yeah. I think that probably should be on our list at some point, uh, or at least one of the evil deads. One of the evil deads or Army of Darkness or you know, something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh no, I mean, I'm putting I'm 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 putting uh Evil Dead 2 on there since we've discussed that several times about putting Evil, evil Dead 2 is such a classic cult film. I mean, it, it, there's just so much about it to like, you know, <laughs> and it, it it gave it gave it gave Sam Raimi a chance to Say okay, I wish I'd done this differently, you know. After Evil Dead One, so we got to do it all in Evil Dead Two, and it really shows. Oh but yeah, that's like, for another podcast. Isn't it? It, it, <laughs> all right, so getting back to Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses, I'm well, actually going to start this one off um, by telling everyone my little story with this movie before I get to your guys' stories, because normally I ask you first, and then I get to mine eventually if i get to my story but uh 
<laughs> I am a huge Rob Zombie fan, music wise. Uh, and when I heard that he was directing his first feature length film, I was dying to see this movie, House of a Thousand Corpses, which then, once he directed it, sat on a shelf uh, with for almost two years. For two for years. years yeah. uh, so for two years, I was dying and waiting to see this <laughs> freaking movie. Uh, and then, of course, when it actually does get released, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's finally getting released. They give it a limited release. Yep. So it only plays in a handful of theaters, of which I was nowhere near any of them. And yeah. when it came out, I missed it. I was pissed off. Like, I don't know what. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she was able to see the movie, and I was, like, envious the entire time. Because I wanted to see <laughs> what the hell Rob Zombie did with this movie that had a kick-ass trailer to it uh speaking of, i don't want to interrupt you too long but speaking of the trailer i have an interesting question about this trailer there are two trailers to this movie because the thing that first intrigued me was right when this movie was going to be released by universal they put out a teaser for it yeah right. teaser there was not a single frame of footage from the movie in it there was it was frame slow dolly of a cemetery getting dug up by two guys in hazmat suits. Yeah. <laughs> then just like the title and some credits saying like the you know November first cops came to ex to investigate the most infamous crime of the 20th century and just like something about the music of it that mm -hmm, just like the whole thing was just like disturbing and terrifying and I would argue actually that much more than anything in the actual movie, but. <laughs> well, like one, well they, yeah, that's because the Universal didn't really know what the movie was about. Obviously, I mean they they had not seen any of the footage, and um, uh, uh, they were getting ready to open up the uh, House of a Thousand Corpses inspired uh, uh, oh, haunted yeah. house that Zombie had designed for them. That's right. So they that's just sort of they just wanted to sort of pitch the movie they knew would be coming out soon, which it wasn't, you know, because it had to work. Because of all that we can, we'll talk about that. The mess that he had to go through to get <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so Kevin yeah. Was... So there are definitely two different, two different teaser trailers for the oh. movie. Oh yeah. So was that the one you saw, Kevin, or was it a different one? I saw the other one, the actual trailer. I've seen both of them. Uh, but I kind of like you. Dismissed... But you're probably you're talking about the one in 2003 when they finally did get a release on. Yes, because the first one didn't, like you said, didn't have any footage for the film, so I dismissed that. It's kind of like yeah, and you and nobody had a chance to see it unless they were at Universal Studios at the theme park, or uh, I'm trying to think where else it, 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 and it was on, you know, just in the limited release theaters. Yeah, it was limited release. That was like... it. Yeah, it, it wasn't many. Nope. Uh, but when I did finally see it, I was um. Unfortunately, a bit disappointed. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh yeah, I was a bit disappointed. So I'm coming from the 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 the, the other house of uh, <laughs> uh of fans of like I didn't really like this movie at all. Uh, but because it it was like a feature length music video to me, and I just uh, I and I'd seen zombies music videos before. Sure. I just wasn't expecting that. The last time I saw a movie that should never have been a movie was the movie Belly, and that was like a music videos, <laughs> like a rap music videos with a, a film that had no sense whatsoever. And that's what <laughs> my first impression of House of a Thousand Corpses when I first saw. It. That being said. Uh, my opinion has differed since then, but I'm going to get down now to your two perspectives of this movie because I'm sure it will be much different than mine. <laughs> Who Damn you! Uh, oh well, actually, you, you know, in a sense, Kevin, our our reviews may not be that much different than we thought. I know we've talked about this before in mm -hmm. private. Um, yeah, I, I got caught up in the hoopla on that, and then finally, by the time it did come out. In two thousand and three, not it's not that I sort of forgot about it, but I was you know, I sort of forgotten about what it was supposed to be all about. Um, I I didn't catch it in the theater because, like you, I was you know well we we live near to each other, so it it was nowhere as near Atlanta. Um, so when I did finally get to see it, I think it was on HBO, if I'm not oh. or whoever it was that released it HBO or Showtime or I think I'm pretty sure it was HBO. Um, it was late at night. Oh. And I really struggled with this movie. Uh, <laughs> the first time I saw it, and I think it was just because I was exhausted. I'd worked all day. And this is not a good movie to watch tired. 
um, it, you know, get, you know, I, I was almost falling asleep during some parts. And that's not a commentary on the movie, folks. That's a commentary on the viewer. Uh, <laughs> so it was about like a year after I had seen that thinking, ah, you know, it, it, you know, I would see it list the listings for it and stuff and go, oh yeah, I sort of remember that. But then I've I finally decided to sit down and watch it. And you know, it was like in in a mid afternoon setting. I was in, you know, mentally in pretty good shape, and I really liked what I saw because it was so different than a lot of other films that horror films that I'd seen up until that point. It really had a uh, a style to it that really intrigued me. And then, of course, that uh, right after that, I, uh, the uh, Devil's Rejects was released, and I, I just went to town on that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just loved that film. So uh, I saw them both within like three or four months of each other. Oh, okay. But yeah, yeah. my opinion definitely changed in the second viewing. Mm. How about you, Thomas? Well, I think I'm slight. It's funny how like I'm slightly different uh, in my views on this movie than either of you, but very similar in the circumstances uh, of seeing it to Jim. Um, uh, I had seen that teaser, that original Universal teaser that came out and thought, ooh, this is going to be interesting. Because I, I also am a fan of Mr. Zombie's music. Um, and I will refer to him as such because I respect the man. And I love to think that if God willing, one day I meet him, bump into him, I'll say, oh, Mr. Zombie, nice to meet you. And I hope Rob would have a nice sense of humor to say, hey, Mr. Zombie was my dad. Call me Rob. <laughs> <laughs> but uh <laughs> but um so i saw that and the movie disappears for two years and then <laughs> I, and i don't think i ever actually saw any of the newer trailers for it but i saw I, I had known it had come out and i had thought that it had come and gone i didn't realize that it was actually a hit and we'll talk about what it actually did oh yeah terms. yeah I, I didn't realize it was a hit i thought it just kind of came and went because uh, I remember the hoopla around it when it was when it did come out, some of the controversy, and we'll get into that as well. Um, so I just ended up watching it just because with uh, my, my cousin Dominic, who's a firefighter and a paramedic and EMT and a close, close friend of mine. He came over the house. I was still living with my parents at the time, and we just sat and watched most of it. I don't think he made it through. Uh, <laughs> I had to go home. Because we started this movie, I think, at like 11.30 at night on HBO. Um, or it was Cinem HBO, okay. It, uh, it, you had definitely probably was, I don't know. I, I, I had so many paid premium cable channels. Well, the, I did too. Yeah, uh, I, had, I, I had them all. <laughs> so I always confuse them. But, but the movie is so like kind of scuzzy and it's, and, and it's kind of style. I like to imagine it was Cinemax, really. But uh, <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Because this is the sort of movie that it aspires to be the sort of thing that would play on Cinemax really late at night. But uh, so like we started it late and we were and we watched it like Easter Eve, like Saturday night before Easter. <laughs> and by the time we done, by the time the movie was done, I, I feel I feel like I my soul needed a shower. And <laughs> And I, I felt I felt bad for watching it on Easter Eve. <laughs> felt like I needed to break. <laughs> but uh, it was um, it was a, an experience. And I and I came and like Kevin, I was disappointed. I I, I uh, in fact, if you go onto my letterbox, you'll find it's actually listed on my list of uh, top ten or top twenty uh, least favorite movies. Um, <laughs> Interesting. I, I, I thought for a very long time that it is one of the worst movies I'd ever seen. Um, my my opinion on it has has changed a little bit. Um, I, I don't think it's as bad as I thought it was. And but even then, even when I thought it was terrible, I thought to myself, "This is a terrible movie that has great parts in it." Like and I used to, and I used to say all the time, to people like, "If every scene in House of Thousand Corpses was as good or or, or as." <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me clarify. If every scene in House of a Thousand Corpses was as funny and creepy and bizarre and well executed, underlining that, as the murder ride scene at the beginning of the movie, we're sitting. Oh at, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then the movie would have been a stone cold classic. I mean, that was because to me that was that that whole segment was just like 
encapsulates everything that the movie wants to be and only on occasion actually accomplishes. Because I think because this was Rob's first movie, Mr. Zombie, I'm sorry. Mr. Zombie's first movie, uh, I feel like he makes a lot of the first movie mistakes and just kind of does everything because he thinks he might only get one shot at this. Agree, uh, agree. <laughs> well, that's true. And and even even Rob admitted that he this is not his favorite film. That I, I, uh, that, that he felt like he made he says every time he watches it, he sees flaw after flaw after flaw. So yeah, it was definitely a learning experience for him, I think. Oh yeah, for sure. So that was my first exposure to this movie late at night on Easter <laughs> Eve. On, <laughs> in fact, I might not have even seen the whole thing all the way through. I and mean, there may have been parts where I changed channels and then came back. Because oh, because kids, kids, if you're listening, this is something that people used to do back in the day, when TV was broadcasted, and <laughs> you would have, you would have, you'd be able to change, press a button and change to another channel, and something would just be playing instantly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so this seems to be a movie in which we have all like had misgivings. The original watch of it, and then we watch it again, and uh, we. Our, our opinions change. Now, I have to admit, this is actually one of the things that I actually enjoy about Zombies films is that I tend to enjoy his films more the second time I watch his films. I think yeah. I discussed earlier with uh, with Jim in a different episode in regards to his Halloween 2. I hated that movie when I first saw it, but that <laughs> I actually enjoy now more than I did the first one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only, the only, uh, the only two of his films I actually really loved the first time I saw them, which was uh, uh, the Lords of Salem. Uh, Lords of Salem, I really like. I yeah, really loved that yeah, movie, yeah, and yeah. I really loved Devil's Rejects when and I first. Devil's saw them. Rejects, those are the two that, yeah, out of the blocks, it was like, damn, I, those are good movies. I think those two were were absolutely. I love those films for my first watch. Most of absolutely. Films, I I actually ended up enjoying more the second time. His Halloween and Halloween Two, I especially liked better the second time watching them. Um, I, Halloween Two, I've actually seen more than I had first Halloween. Oh yeah, I'll definitely grant you. Devil's Rejects is his masterpiece, hands down, far and away. Um, I don't think he's made anything better, and uh, especially since uh, he went back to that well with uh, Three from Hell, and from what I understand, it wasn't as good. So it was it? it was an ambivalent movie. You know, it was it, it had some moments that I really liked, but it it was not a Devil's Rejects. You know, it just just didn't quite work on all cylinders. It, there was missing Sid Haig. Sid Haig was, you know, that, when I that watched, hurt it a lot. I think it, it, it did hurt it a lot because I actually really enjoyed him in House of a Thousand Corpses when I rewatched. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I did not yeah. care for anything the first time I watched it, but when I rewatched it, I said, "Damn, I actually loved Sid Haig in this movie. He's it's so great." Cool this movie. Well, you know that you know the, the the fun part about this movie about House of a Thousand Corpses is, and and it and 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 Rob was has been a little vocal about about his opinions on this or the experience was the audiences, even their test audiences before they actually got a, a final cut, sort of sympathized or rooted for the fireflies. Uh, you know, they for for the bad guys. I mean they they, they you you learn to sort of want to see these guys make it in some sick way. <laughs> and and he said it wasn't intended to be that way, but that's just how the film unfolded as they were shooting. Now, he I said it was really, really, it gave it that black comedy feel to it. Yeah, uh, I don't think for a second, Jim, that uh, Mr. Zombie intended, didn't intend for for audiences to uh, root for the Firefly clan from the get-go. Uh, <laughs> I, I, because, I mean, let's face it, you look at his aesthetic as an artist, and he's always all about the outsider, the crazy. Well, that's true. That's true. The freak, yeah. the psycho. So all of that. So all that to say. Also, let's face it. Look at the uh, the quote the normies the uh, the quote main characters the four the two couples in yeah. this movie are lambs to the slaughter. Whom, uh, according to this uh, article that I looked up, this oral history of the movie from the uh, Daily Beast, uh, apparently Rob cast uh, Rain Wilson and. Uh, Chris Hardwick, as in the Nerdist News guy, um, right? <laughs> as his two as his two leads because they were his friends, and the, and I assume also the ladies as well. But like you watch it, and those two characters are so badly written and so like annoying and so 
just like there's nothing to them, especially the ladies. Unfortunately, I feel like there's no. Uh, there, there's, yeah, there's really not much to the gals at all. Chris no. Hardwick is just ob obnoxious. He's just annoying. Can you imagine uh, you're you know. to go to be to go to somebody like this to, 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 for, for Rob to go to some Mr. Zombie, sorry, to go to somebody <laughs> and say, "I'd like you to play this annoying, obnoxious a hole that gets uh, you know surgically." Uh, you know, rapes basically at the end of this movie. Uh, and I thought about you. I wanted, I wrote this part for you. And like, what does that say when you're like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> so so I, I want to bring this up because when I just rewatched it uh, again, I, I, I saw something in the film that I never saw before. And I, because you guys are film nerds and you've probably seen this movie, hopefully you've seen this movie and you may oh, have yeah. seen references yeah. to it. Uh, as I was watching it again, I realized how many references uh, Rob Zombie made to the movie The Old Dark House. Oh, with, God, they're all over the place. Up. They're Absolutely. all over the place. Yeah. And I did not know this at the first time I saw this Yes, movie, yeah. Which is really bad for me because that's one of my favorite movies of all time. And I'm yeah, like, it's a ter yeah, it's a terrific film. But yeah, there, it, it even I think he had to be influenced in oh, the storyline yeah. that he came up with because it's right. I mean, it's. The freaks that are in Old Dark House, I mean, match up. They, they would get along so well with the Firefly clan. I can see uh, Tiny being like Boris Karloff in the Absolutely. Old Dark House. Yeah, I yeah. saw, you know, the whole fact that they, you know, their car breaks down in the middle of the yep. storm and they end up going. <laughs> I'm like, did he just riff on the Old Dark House? And, yeah, and the women, the women in the family in that movie. I mean, everything. Yeah, there's a lot of things that match up really well with that. Yeah, I. I have a greater appreciation because of this now. Maybe oh, they I, should have released it as a reboot of the old Dark House. <laughs> I, I, Boy, what universal it had to fit with that one. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, honestly, like this, you know, as as, I'm, and as much as I'm not that much of a huge fan of this movie, I will say, like, you're right. This movie is almost nothing but references to other things. Mm -hmm. um, it's really... As a as much as it prides itself of being quote an original vision, I don't think that really Mr. Zombie really hit his own original vision quote unquote until his later movies, Devil's Rejects and all that. Yeah, this yeah, kind rejects of, definitely. Yeah. He was finding that vision. I think I don't know who it was, but somebody somebody said that when you're starting off writing, you're basically just you know copying your influences, and it's later on that you sure. start to grow and become you find your voice. Mm -hmm. So with, I think all he was doing was taking his influences, putting them in a very large blender, putting hot sauce in it, and just, you know, pressing frappe. And that's what came out, was this movie. Um, although apparently, according to this article, uh, the real genesis for this movie, and when I read this, I was like, yeah, that tracks, uh, is that apparently Rob Zombie came up with the idea for this movie while working on a Halloween haunted attraction. Yeah, no, he, he was working on a haunted attraction for Universal. Yeah, that, yeah. that's... And Really? Yeah. Because if you think about it, this movie, aside from um the obvious reference to text to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yeah. although I mm -hmm. although I would argue the movie is really more of a borrow from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. I agree. I agree, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is yeah. much more of the second one, yeah. And and Motel Hell and uh yep. Alive, and uh, you know, Hills Have Eyes, the original, obviously. And all that, but structurally speaking, in the end and tonally speaking, I think it's really kind of something. It seems to me that he set out to create a haunted attraction on film because the movie has the structure of a haunted attraction. And for better or worse, he, I think he succeeded. He kind of created something yeah. that, like a haunted attraction, you go there. You get in, and it's full of cheap um, scare effects from different from from other things. Some guide takes you along. You're on a track. You're not getting anywhere. You're you're stuck there, and uh, you go from jump to jump. Although I counted, there really aren't that many jump scares in this movie. Um, oh, very few. Yeah, and uh, and you just go from one thing to the other, going deeper and deeper and deeper until you just come out the end, and it ends pretty pretty abruptly, kind of like a on an attraction does so it has that feel of it in fact i mean i would say some of the the music even has 
the feeling, the tone, the some of the effects of the sounds you would hear in a haunted attraction. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, say what you will about the movie, and I will, but uh, and have already. <laughs> uh, the soundtrack to this movie is amazing. It is uh, amazing. Abso- absolutely. The, the music in it is great. I would argue actually that the music is scarier than the movie is because if you listen <laughs> to uh, the the first the, the title track, you know, I love the, that. Yeah. The house where nobody lives is uh, yeah. it sets the tone. Then that opening credit sequence um, after that great little kind of Pulp Fiction esque opening where you know Captain Spaulding. Uh, kills the two robbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great <laughs> scene. Um, that that sound you hear, like one of the one of the refrains at the end, uh, musically is this. Yep. <laughs> that sounds very much like one of those little stupid little effects sound effects you'd hear. Maybe a little bat hanging on a string goes. Woo! Little theremin, yep. <laughs> so like, like, so he's just throwing everything in it that could possibly go in that sort of thing. And for what I understand, also like Mr. Zombie was like raised basically by carnies. So he so he has kind of that carnival sort of aesthetic going for him. And I think he was trying to capture that. And he kind of sort of did it. Oh, I think I, he got that. Yeah. Yeah. He got that, but he doesn't have anything remotely resembling a narrative cohesion or uh even a even a thematic thrust. Although going back to the inclusion of Chris Hardwick in it, this is something I noticed just this new watch um, that you have Chris Hardwick in this movie who went on to become kind of the face of nerd culture for a brief. Yeah. And now, and, and this movie like Texas Chainsaw Massacre is kind of about a culture clash, you know, well, how did my cat get in here? That's weird. Anyways, you have the culture clash in Texas Chainsaw, which was about hippies versus rednecks, you know, Mm. liberal versus conservative. Now, in this movie, you have a different dynamic, but similar. You have rednecks versus nerds. Yeah. So, and this movie came out in 2000. Well, it was being made in 2000. It was, yeah, shot in 2000. Yeah. Made in 2000. Right. And X Men did not come out till 2000. So, right. Rob, so Mr. Zombie was like really like on the very, very beginning of that wave before nerd culture was about to become culture. So in a sense, I think maybe with that, maybe not even meaning to, he was making a comment that um, about uh, the rise of nerd culture. Because like, who are these two people? We don't know very much about these two couples, but we know that they are just total nerds for quote, weird stuff. Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So, think about it. Yeah. So if you think about it, like these are your victims. These are your audience surrogates. Also, remember, what was the date this movie was supposed to take place in? November? 1977. What big movie came out that year? Yeah, gee, I can't Star Wars? Imagine. Star Wars. <laughs> yep, yeah, Star I'm about to say, I had to think about it because I was born in the 76. Uh, Star I'm... Wars, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this is, so I don't think it's an then accident. Then Halloween that... comes out the following year. <laughs> exactly. I don't think it's an accident that Mr. Zombie chooses to set it on that in that in that time period oh no no he sets a lot of his films in that time period he loves he he's he's been known to to, to say he loves that whole time period he and uh quentin tarantino both love the late 70s yeah but i think maybe he was trying to he, was, he did pick that particular date on purpose to kind of set a it could be there's some kind of comment on the rise of nerd culture and maybe also the death of nerd culture <laughs> that which incidentally here we are 20 years later and we're i think within our lifetime i say soon and very soon i'm calling it now um i hope i'm wrong but i don't think i am that i think we're gonna see the death of nerd culture very soon i I wish i yeah i wish i'm wrong i I hope to be wrong but i i think it's i don't know yeah i i I, you know 77 was more than 40 years ago and you know so it's it's had a pretty nice run so far I think it's had a pretty nice run, but I think with uh, you know the proliferation of it through Disney and the kind of slow slow decline. Well, of- I I think the superhero thing is slowing down. I, and- I think you know I mean for those of us who are comic book geeks and stuff that growing up, yeah, it's you know I could yeah. never get enough of that stuff, but the general public is getting to, getting fatigued. 
Yeah. When it comes I, to that. Yeah. I mean, there may be some changes here and there, but I think it's monster yeah. kid stuff. It's going to, there's going to be a large contingent of us always around. Oh, 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 no question about it. Horror is not going anywhere because yeah, even, it never does. Be, even during the pandemic, there were still horror movies making money. Oh, absolutely. But I want to, yeah. I do want to take one little exception with, 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 with some of the things that have been said about this film, especially by the critics who, who the biggest criticism this film got, and by the way, they made their money back. Uh, they doubled their money back in the first, first day it released. That's uh, true. So yeah, it did, did very well. Um, you know, saying, well, it was just a hodgepodge. It, it, it didn't have any story, didn't make any sense and all that stuff. <laughs> and I disagree. I disagree. I, I think disagree. there is a logic to this movie. And there's, it, it reminds me, of course, I grew up in upstate New York. I spent a lot of time in New York City. New York City has a couple of these really weird museums. I'll just call them museums of the weird. They're very specified things, but you go in and you're, it, it's like, yeah, uh, it's like a, a circus. Uh, I mean, like a, a carnival midway, you know, oh, yeah. like some of the some of the shows that they would have. Yeah, uh, you know, like Fish Boy and all that stuff, you know, yeah. and <laughs> and and this film was sort of a microcosm of that. I mean, it's like these guys go into this Cap Captain Spaulding's, you know, Museum of the Weird or whatever he called it, um, and then and then their whole lifestyle of of the Firefly Clan and stuff was that i mean it was just like uh going into one of these damn museums yourself in film and then okay. and then i looked back at universal they were going to call their their attraction house of a thousand corpses that was one part of it they loved that rob zombie had come up with but then <laughs> after they had their falling out and decided not to not to uh, handle the film they kept the attraction they still liked the attraction they called it american nightmare which is like, yeah, that's what this film is almost. It's oh, like, that's it's funny. A nightmare. <laughs> but I mean, so I think there is some narrative uh, pluses to this, to the way this film's put together. Such as? <laughs> it's like it's like walking into the middle of one of these weirdo museums that are that proliferate all over this country. If you look hard enough, there's some really weird shit out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I and, mean, like, and you know that but, seems to be the cornerstone of what yeah. what's going on here well except you've got a family who's actually living it yeah. you know, it's not like a pt barnum attraction where you know there's a sucker born every minute these people actually live it yeah. you know they're in another plane of existence yeah well i mean i see what you're saying but uh, you know i would say like nailing an aesthetic is only half the battle in terms of making a good story and i think that's that's probably the big thing that's missing here that is present in some of his later stuff, like Devil's Rejects, for instance, um, is interesting characters and a story that works. I don't think the story here really works. If it does work story-wise, it's only because they borrowed that from other movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Old Dark House. <laughs> it's like, because like, okay, as I was, if you take a macro perspective of this movie, <laughs> If you think about it, um, first of all, I'd like you to justify why the heck the skunk ape snippets are even in there. There's no reason for them to be there at all. Yeah, um, but he he had to cut a, a lot of that out for the uh, to try to get the R rating. Apparently, oh, that, that was that was one of the one of the unfortunate storylines that took a beating. I'm sure, there's a whole he, bunch of storylines. Oh, he cut he cut like 40 minutes out of this film. It sounds like Ron. It sounds like our friend Ron, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, he had to cut a lot out of this movie because it was, yeah. it was destined for an NC-17. But the Skunk Ape storyline, yeah, got really trashed. Except you for just literally, a few I know, like snippets. you could literally, literally, you could take. Um, I think there is. You could, you could probably go through this movie and cut out. Um, the, all the skunk gay part you could you know what here and this is one of the biggest problems you could cut out the entire sheriff subplot out of this movie and it would not affect it at all you could literally just pretend like but i no, love that character <laughs> i know i do too but they do nothing to advance the plot they just die and move on i mean grant <laughs> well we'll talk about how they die because that's also important in terms of our <laughs> 
in terms of our discussion of this movie, it is not important to the plot. <laughs> it tells us nothing new about the Firefly Clan except that they would kill cops. We kind of gather that already from who they are because they would, I mean, come on. They'll kill anything. But they'll kill anything pretty much except their own, which is also very interesting. I get, oh, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. I get the impression they would not kill each other. Um, but No, they won't. They'll fight a lot, but they won't. Uh, they oh, won't yeah. Be, but, that, that but they won't get um, physically violent with one another. No. Yeah, exactly. So the but the thing is, like, you could cut out all of the snippets. You could cut out so much of, of just the, like, random, like, aside um, things. And you could probably, and, and this movie would probably end up being about 30 minutes long. <laughs> it could easily be a creep show se uh, segment. Because, like, the, the main through line of just kids go to the, go to the side, go to Captain Spaulding's shack. Captain Spaulding says, hey, you want to go see the tree? Go see the tree. We are led to believe that they took a wrong turn, but it's pretty obvious, I think, when you watch it the second time around, that there was no wrong turn being. Oh had. no, no, they, that was a trap. Yeah, yeah I was, mean, I, I saw that. I mean, even the even the first viewing, I didn't like. I I picked her up on, you know, this was all. Except I didn't, I didn't assign Spalding's part in it until till the end of the movie, but it was just like, yeah, they, these folks, you know, they 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 set the trap, and that's how they. That's how they had their fun. To, yeah, to exactly. Drag people in so, there, which is used yeah. a lot in old in a lot of old monster movies. Right. Yeah. There's there's no surprises there, and even when you finally go down the hole, um, well, literally, in the in the core in the in the coffin with the two, we're jumping around a bit here in the plot, such as it is. Oh no. But yeah, uh, no. but but this movie is edited so you know scattered a lot, so like scatterbrained that you can jump around a lot, and it doesn't really matter because yeah, the movie. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Uh, even even though it has a general progression forward, like the carnival ride, um, it's uh, to me it wasn't that surprising. I mean, it was it was visually interesting at least to see the bone catacombs and see uh, Doctor Satan, who looks kind of like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles villain a little bit. Uh, <laughs> But that was about it. I mean, we don't really see very... I mean, Dr. Satan really doesn't do very much. Mm -hmm. Most of the chasing is done by this other unnamed mutant thing that with an axe that the apparently... Professor. All <laughs> what a, yeah, that's what they call him. That was, but, that was, that's what he's listed at in, in the credit line, but it, that's it. never referred to it in the movie. You know? And apparently he almost really killed that girl because... He like, almost did. Yeah, so that's... That's uh, upsetting. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. He, the costume wouldn't allow him to see, and Rob Zombie said, "We just hoped that uh, that she'd get out of the way in time." <laughs> oh Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. So, yeah, we've think... worked. We've worked on some films like that, Kevin. <laughs> speaking of Doc, and speaking of Doctor Satan, apparently Doctor Satan, the name comes from a 1940s movie serial called "The Mysterious Doctor Satan." That's exactly right. <laughs> I have to put that on my list. I'm not even familiar with that one. Okay. Yeah, I've yep. not seen that one either. Yeah, that it's a little before very, my time it, too. It is very hard to find, and it's four hours long. So, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, most of them were like twelve episodes and a half an hour piece. Or yeah. well, yeah. that just shows you that Rob Zombie comes from the school of like a Quentin Tarantino. He takes a lot of stuff, oh, yeah. his influences from other films and other people and then you know tries to make a hodgepodge of that stuff into his own movies speaking uh, of speaking of influence i want to put this question to both of y'all okay because, because it's because it, because it's a reoccurring uh discussion in his uh in his ovure there's a thing <laughs> that keeps coming up or should i say a, a person who keeps coming up over and over again and um and uh, this person is a um does a huge dance number a musical number if you will in this movie when the when the when the two when the four couples are having to stay after their car is getting oh yeah the so sherry, moon, sherry moon zombie does a betty boop musical number betty boop, yeah in this in the movie, <laughs> call it that uh and so i guess the question i have is um i thought the musical number was okay i love the split screen the brian de palma yeah, yeah. <laughs> the question is like do you think that she's a bad actress i've never thought she was a bad actress i thought that that's the way the character was uh written yeah yeah i mean i know she she doesn't think much of her acting style i mean she uh she doesn't really care about being an actress 
yeah. per se. Yeah, she she you know just and that's why you only see her in Rob Zombie films for the with the exception of a couple other appearances she made on TV, some little jumping roles. But uh, no, I think she was perfect for this role. Uh, yeah, because I loved her in Devil's Rejects. Now, oh, absolutely. Now uh, she really shines. In that and Lords of Salem, I loved her in that too. And uh, she was very, very good in that one. Yeah. But I just think this movie overall is rough because they hadn't figured out their characters until the Devil's Rejects. So well, you know, you know, Rob did say he 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 told Universal he wanted to make a drive-in type film. Yeah, he wanted to agree, and, and so I attributed some of that as being a little intentional. Yeah, because when you uh, think of your typical grindhouse films, uh, you know, sometimes the story is not exactly the sharpest part of them. Well, that's why yeah. I say Sid Haig is so much better the sec the, the next time I watched it. Oh is, yeah, the first yeah. time I watched it, I just I just couldn't get into it. But the second time is like Sid Haig is acting his ass off. You could especially when cops come to see him, and he's so subtle in some of the, his manipulations. It's one of my favorite scenes. Yeah. I was like, dude. <laughs> It doesn't matter. I mean, your character is crazy as shit, but you were so good as this character <laughs> in the first film. Like, Otis has some, I mean, uh, Bill Mosley has some good lines in the first yeah, film. Yeah. Otis, he's much better in Devil's Rejects. Sid oh, Hayes yeah. has some yeah. great scenes in House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, yeah. Jerry Moon becomes better in Devil's Rejects. Uh, oh, she's, yeah, she's, she's rough yeah, in this Definitely point. a step up. Yeah, know, she's yeah. rough. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I wouldn't say she's a bad actress. I'd say she's just a limited actress. There's only certain things she can do very well. But um, but you, or you, is it or is it that that's we've only seen her? In you know, I, I don't know. You know, I I would love I'd love to. Well, the thing is, after reading, I because I I was fascinated with her. I, I've done a lot of research into her herself, and it's that when when I sort of found out, read you know from from her from things that she. would she doesn't do interviews. She doesn't do the whole movie thing at all. And, uh, you know, when I heard that, it's like, well, you know, as a director, I would love to try her in a role where she could flex her wings a little bit, but apparently she doesn't want to. No, she doesn't so, want to, you know, which it's is probably fine. So, yeah, I mean, so she wants to stick with stuff like this. Well, she probably just likes hanging out with her husband on set. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, if you notice, yeah, I mean, she'll do it for Rob Zombie, but uh i should you know you don't really see her do anything else for any other directors no but look at her her roles as baby in these three movies oh yeah her role in halloween versus her role in True. lords of salem that's right they're not the same characters but no. for some reason people see her and they just see one character kind of like rob zombie they see yes. rob zombie yeah. and they see oh he can only do one type of movie and he's kind of did different genres. You look at House of Zombies and Corpses, which is like you said, you gave it perfect, uh, Thomas. You gave it a perfect uh, wording. Mm -hmm. It's a freaking carnival ride. I never thought about that. Exactly. Yeah, that's it's exactly what it was. Yeah. But the second one, Devil's Rejects, is like a freaking western. Uh, when oh, western. yes. Yeah. Oliver yeah. Stone movie, pretty much. Yeah. 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 It, it's so different. And then, of course, he does his version of Halloween, which is a serial killer movie it is not a boogeyman movie he is creating no a it's a serial killer movie but uh um, and he still shouldn't have let michael myers talk <laughs> and then of course in halloween 2 he's created this surreal uh serial killer movie but it's surreal yeah. and that's one of the things why i like that movie it's very metaphysical yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. And yeah. lords of salem dude yes it's this witchcraft subtle surrealistic movie and i think it's, it was freaking brilliant um i i don't think i, he, I agree I don't think he likes to repeat himself. I think sometimes he has fun. What what was it? Thirty? I think his movie was thirty. I think that movie is called. Oh yeah, I just I, you know, I just I just discovered that one not too you know about like so, two years ago. That yeah. one, that was re yeah, it had Malcolm McDowell in it. Yeah, and uh, that was a kind of liked that a lot. Yes, <laughs> I liked it a lot, a lot more than I, I thought. Where was this movie? I've never heard of it before. Yeah. <laughs> You it's know. on Tubi. I think what it what it, what it, what it I think that's it, where I caught, I think that's where I caught it was on Tubi yeah, yeah. with the commercials. That is actually that is actually Mr. Zombie's uh version of his remake of Most Dangerous Game. Yes, mm -hmm. yes it is. Exactly what it is. Yep. 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 And I think he took his aesthetics from House of a Thousand Corpses, made the most dangerous game and stuck them in the movie and that's exactly what he got. And it's a much more yeah. movie than House of a Thousand Corpses because he knows what he's doing now. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. But I he's was had very time. impressed with him. He's had time to develop his style, his yeah. stories, and all that type of stuff. Uh, I'm surprised that one hasn't somewhere. been discovered by more people. Not because yeah. it came and went. Like the House of yeah, a Thousand yeah. Corpses, it got a limited release and then it kind of disappeared, which is sad. Right, right. Because I missed that one too. I try to see his because I enjoy his movies. <laughs> uh, oh, I do. Yeah. I get a kick out of his stuff. Yeah. So I missed that one because it simply kind of came and went, like House of a Thousand Corpses, yeah. limited release. It didn't get. You know, I was like, "Fuck, man!" I got no marketing at all. No. Yeah. So, so speaking of Sid Hag, I want to say this in here for for the record because it moves my heart so much to hear. Um, I don't know if you know the story of this is probably why Mr. Hag gives his all in this movie is because um, uh, the story goes, I don't know how much of this is apocryphal, but the story goes that uh, Sid Hag was working as a janitor in a high school before he did this movie. He had had a long career in, um, in bit parts playing bad guys for many, many, many years, uh, even back at the stay back to like the early sixties. Uh, oh, absolutely. Doing, yeah. He's been with like a, spider he's baby. A long and, time. Yep. Oh yeah, and he had just and he'd fallen on really hard times and thought his career was over and this is how he was going to live out his remaining years as a janitor in school and somehow Rob Zombie found him and said he was such a huge fan of his movies and he was just like oh shucks man you got to be kidding me just go away with that he wouldn't even cuz he didn't know who Rob Zombie was <laughs> listen to his music <laughs> so but then he kept hounding Sid he's like hey I'd like you to be in my movie I want you to play this you know play this character and he pitched him the character and apparently, you know, he, you know, broke down and cried and took the script. He's like, yes, I would love to do this. And so, and that's how his late career resurgence started. I and mean, he's like, oh, I think he was almost like 50, some 58 years old when he. That, that's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. We had, a, we had an opportunity to have my first podcast to, to talk to Sid quite a bit. And uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino actually got him it sort of got him going and that's how rob got got a hold of him as well because he was in jackie brown he had a small part in jackie brown but he hadn't up until that point acted in in anything serious for almost 15 years i mean pretty much you're right it was he was pretty much just doing anything he could to 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 stay alive you know just yeah. to, to support himself well, I love the fact that he came back for this movie because I'm a huge Sid Haig fan. And when I finally got to meet him, because House of a Thousand Corpses has the has a weird fan culture. Uh, oh, absolutely. And when I, you know, we, I, at Days of the Dead, you know, Jim, we do that all the damn time. I got to meet Sid. Great guy. And uh, he'd be there every year. That's right. Yeah. He was there all the time. And he was really, yeah, when I asked him, which when he asked me which picture I wanted to, him to sign, of course, you know, he's a bunch of Devil's Rejects, House of a Thousand Corpses. And I'm the guy who picks up the Spider Baby. I was like, dude, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. Can you sign this one? I was like, he was like, ah, oh, you picked that one. There's other, people haven't picked that one in a while. I was like, yeah, because except for I, me, except I got one. From I, I was like, I could have picked the House of a Thousand Devils Reject, but I'm like, dude, yeah. Spider Baby is one of my all time favorite movies, dude. I had I did, well, I told him, I told him I wanted that one because he was one of the few people I'd ever met that had worked with Lon Chaney Jr. Yeah, no, it dude. was a huge, and he, he, he got very emotional when we talked uh, on the podcast about. Lon Chaney Jr. He, you know, that was his his idol. You know, that was the guy mentored him through Spider Baby, and he was just getting going. And um, it's amazing to me how many times I saw Sid Haig and didn't realize I'd seen Sid Haig. Um, he was like on every seventies TV show I ever watched. Uh, yeah, he. And I didn't. Him. I didn't know who he was. I mean, I mean, I knew Spider Baby, but I just, you know, he didn't look anything. You know, when he was he was so young in Spider Baby. Um, uh -huh. you'd never know it was him, you know, in the seventies stuff, but, uh, well, I yeah. watched him in all the, uh, black exploitation movies too. So like, yeah, I, he would just show up and now he shows up everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I know Sid Haig from. I want, you know, I've seen all the, 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 the black exploitation movies that he showed or the, the, the women in prison movies, I guess is the best way of, uh, of saying it. Cause he showed up in every one of those. Yeah. The one, I think the one that surprised me the most was I went back and binged, um, Buck Rogers in the 25th century recently. He shows up in that in a two part episode as a bad guy. And I'm like, holy shit, I, I didn't realize he was in that. Oh my God. I mean, it was a, it was a weird year for me personally. So, and I loved the book, this show. And then the writer's strike screwed that show up because it was off the air for a while. And 
season one and season two, and then it just destroyed the show. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like, yeah, he, he did a ton of stuff. But yeah, at the time he did House of a Thousand Corpses, he wasn't doing hardly anything at all. No. And you're right. He, and, it, and then all of a sudden, he never stopped working after that. Nope. I mean, it was just nonstop. Bill Mosley's the same way. I remember yeah, him yeah, yeah. when he was young, Night of the Living Dead remake. You know, he right, was in Silent right. Night, Deadly Night 3, for crying out loud. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do realize. Uh, it was in the I, second cha- Chex- Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. You know, uh, but he kind of disappeared, too. And yeah. then all of a sudden, he's now everywhere. And I get to see him in lots of great roles now because uh, he now gets to do pretty much any type of horror movie he wants to. Works with all these oh, yeah, no, it's, other he, character he actors. his own shots. Yeah. yeah. Like, geez. So <laughs> Rob Zombie, he brings them back. Just like just like Absolutely. Tarantino. Well, that's <laughs> that's what the two remind me a lot. I, you know, they, they remind me a lot of each other. They think alike. Mm. Uh, I mean, their styles are much different, but uh <laughs> they have that love for the 70s. Uh I do too, because I, I was, you know, you, you know, just getting out of high school and going into college in in the early 70s, you know, and and um um, so I, I feel like I, I sort of think the, the, the way Tarantino does a little bit. <laughs> and maybe, you know, I haven't met Rob Zombie, so I um, got close because I originally got cast in his Halloween too, but then <laughs> he rewrote the damn script and the part got dropped. So, you know, what can you do? Oh. <laughs> uh. Uh, Thomas, we lost you, but <laughs> I think he's back. He, there he is. He's back with us again. His volume. You got to turn your volume back up. <laughs> it's muted. You're muted. I, you're right. muted. There I, you are. I forgot that I had turned it up to get uh, to because I had to go get a cord to power up. But no yeah, <laughs> yeah. So apparently, Mr. Zombie was supposed to have a, a actual speaking role in this movie. Yes, that's true. But uh, but he cut himself out because he thought he'd be too recognizable. He was going to be the horror host that That's we see right. in the yeah. very beginning of the film. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But he said so, he would. He said to dress up as the horror host. He said they just all say, "Oh, that's just Rob Zombie." <laughs> he would look too much like himself. <laughs> He'd have to cut cut off all of his facial hair for people not to recognize him. That's true. Yeah, I don't think anyone. I don't think anyone would recognize him if he cut off all his facial hair. I don't even think Cherry Moon would recognize him if he yeah. cut off all of his hair. Yeah, but the guy, the guy that ended up playing the role was uh, he's one of the crew members. Yeah, he, he just grabbed. That's another thing I kind of wished I had like taken part in somehow. Like I, I don't know if I would have liked to have worked on this movie, but just to have been like because uh, they shot this movie. On the Universal back lot. Yes, they did. Yeah, yep. in thousand while it was still a park, and so like yes. while they're shooting <laughs> stuff where like you know the freaking you know professor would come out and pff, with a chainsaw and an axe and everything, and all of a sudden you'd see a tram going by, and on your right is the yeah. Rob Zombie's <laughs> House of a Thousand Corpses being shot in production now, and they just wave at the tram. And yeah, he said he screwed up a lot of his takes. <laughs> I'll bet. And, and, and the noise, to, the noise from the rides. Um, I imagine oh, yeah. what that would be like. But that's so strange. Like, because like, and the crew apparently would just stay at the park yeah. because because apparently they would just like not go home. They would just go to the psycho house and party. And then, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They were yeah, right, right. Or they could see the psycho house from there. Yeah. <laughs> That, that the house the house that the fireflies were lived in was the same house they used for best little whorehouse in Texas movie. Oh yes. <laughs> this is the house that this is the house where Dolly lived. <laughs> and 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 on that note, uh, Don Willis, who's the father, you know, Harrison Young, the one who's the father of Denise, who she's calling and trying to get home to, and, and then he's the ex cop that goes. Uh his house was the one that they used to leave it to be. <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> That tracks. <laughs> that tracks. Yeah. So and then, that. then he had, and then there was a movie ranch, not the Spawn movie ranch, but a movie oh, ranch yeah. where he shot, shot uh, a lot of the other stuff at. Mm, okay. Oh yeah, you can tell. You can tell Mr. Zombie's got a thing for Manson because of the references to the Manson. Oh my God! Yes, all yeah. over the place. Yeah. Oh yeah. But I would also like to talk about, and this is kind of a clunky segue, if I, if you don't mind, 
uh, the controversy around this movie. We've we've touched on it a little. Oh, bit. that's right. We haven't even talked about that. Let's 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 just dive right into that because Absolutely. that whole, because the genesis of that is actually I think one of the good the really good well mostly well executed se- sequences of this movie is when the two cops um, Walton Goggins Georgia Boy from Lithia Springs who I love yep. very much oh so yeah I, and and the other guy whose name I can't remember but he has an amazing mustache Tom Tolls uh, yes awesome. finally go to the Firefly house and we think that they're well, I don't know if anybody actually thinks they're going to save the day, but the the conceit is that they're probably going to save our our <laughs> hapless uh, our ha- our hapless uh, nerds. But um, but they, you know, one of them gets to talk to Mama, and the other one stupidly takes the the guy the girl's father around back through their hodgepodge yeah. of baby dolls hanging all over the place because this movie is nothing but filled with junk all over the f- ceiling and everything. I think they'd have um, a yard sale or something, you know. <laughs> the yard sale from hell. And uh, <laughs> and they, they open the door, and all of a sudden there's four crucified, topless women bleeding. Um, and then we go slow-mo, and what song are they playing? I wrote it down. <laughs> I'll remember you. Yeah. The old Slim Whitman song. <laughs> oh gosh, I don't even know who sang it, but you did. So yes. No, it's Slim that... Whitman. Yeah. He was well, he was in the 70s. This guy, uh, they advertised him on like these uh infomercials, uh, these little two-minute commercials that they would throw in there, you know, to sell these these record albums. Nobody knew who he was except from these commercials. Uh, he was very big in, in Great Britain. Uh, he never never made it as a country singer here in the United States until these commercials, and and their big pitch was he outsold Elvis, uh, but that but he outsold Elvis like in Great Britain, uh, not in the United States. But then he became this cult icon in the, in the early to mid seventies. I did not know that, Jim. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> and it gets because so, he was the only yodeling uh, country music singer uh, at the time. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So then we go to a slow, kind of a staccato slow mo. Yeah, and it's you know what's and Mama Karen Black takes out her gun and shoots the guy, shoots the cop in the head. And there goes George. And yeah, it's at this point we are very Scorsese. It is very yes. very Scorsese all over the place, and uh, Mosley comes out back, kills the father, and. And Walton Goggins is just a blibbering mess, and somehow his gun gets into Mosley's hand or something. And, and he dropped. Well, he had it, and then he just—he never used it. He just dropped it. Yeah, and so then he's like on the ground with his hands behind his head. And I, when I saw what he did, what what Mister Zombie does next, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, like. This is like pure cinematic audacity, the sort of thing I think only a first time director really has the balls to do. <laughs> a person who, who has nothing to lose. He does a crane shot yeah. of these two characters that last, I counted it, 20 seconds long. Actually, six, add six to that. It was 26 altogether. <laughs> You're right. Okay. <laughs> I miscounted then. Twenty six seconds. Yeah, I'm not. Long. You're not the only one that did that. Yeah, we, there's a bunch of us that that took it frame by frame to to make sure we got yeah. Because I knew that would be a question on a trivia where, game or something someday, where he does nothing, just yep. holding on them. Just he's about to shoot him, but you don't know. It's like the movie. You're just waiting. Purpose. Yeah, I'm not. The first time I saw the movie, it's like for God's sake, shoot the guy. I was like. <laughs> I, I was I didn't that wasn't my reaction, but my original reaction was like, "What the heck is? Uh, did the movie just break? What's the camera yeah. still moving? <laughs> did my sound go out? <laughs> did my, I'm like, what What is happening? Did, am I, am, did I just slip into a dream world? Am I? Did I just fall asleep watching this and now I'm dreaming it? Is this what's happening? And then, oh, and then he finally gets shot. Yeah, cut to black." And effectively, it's the third act of the movie. After that, but, <laughs> yeah, no, most definitely. Then you go on. Then you go on the real roller coaster ride. Yeah, exactly. But like that, that that was just brilliant for it's a it's you know it's Scorsese ness without just ripping off Scorsese and B it's audacity of trying to do this thing that like 
any normal quote unquote filmmaker would never ever think to do. But apparently that's the movie that almost got this movie not made and not released. That one scene. Yeah, it was a little little too brutal for some of the uh, people. We, the scalping scene wasn't the thing that broke the camel's back. No, I know. I couldn't believe it. Apparently, and and by the way, the scalping scene is not nearly as bad. That's one of my one of my pet peeves about this movie is that for a movie called House of a Thousand Corpses, this movie really only has about four dead bodies in it. <laughs> there are only and pretty much, yeah, yeah. All the I rest, think, well, they're all buried. Yeah, the, not, I guess the other no, nine hundred and ninety-six are buried. Yeah, you don't the see them. There. You don't, you don't see, see them, them, no. You just except for them. that scene at the end where there's a long corridor of skeletons. Yeah, that's it. And, that's... and I said, and I said to Dominic, my cousin, as I was watching this, I'm like, that does not count. Skeletons are not corpses. <laughs> skeletons are skeletons. That's true. And even so, I read today from the production designer himself, there were two hundred, you know, individual skeletons made for this movie to be put in that scene. So there are only <laughs> two hundred skeletons. In oh there. yeah, there's no so, worse near a thousand anything in the movie. So yeah. I, so, so you should have called this movie House of 200 Corpses. So actually, yeah, what's with, with a better name for it? I think House of a Thousand Corpses just jumps out at you. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But apparently uh, Sherry Lansing, not Sherry Lansing. Yes, yeah, Sherry I'm Lansing. Thinking, Sherry Lansing? No, no, right. I'm sorry. I wrote her down. I wrote her name down. I don't want to get her name down wrong. Because apparently the head of Universal went to a test screen. Stacy Snyder was her name. Oh, Universal Stacey Snyder, yeah. Okay. Universal chairwoman Stacy Snyder went to the first test screening of this movie, and when that scene with Walton Goggins getting shot in the head after 26 agonizing seconds, <laughs> that was it. That was the... That, she saw that and said, this movie is not getting released by us. <laughs> I mean, the way it's been told is like, Zombie was like sitting two seats away from her, and he heard people shouting just like um, you did, Kill the freaking copper. <laughs> and then he looked at, he's like, yeah, people are getting in the movie. Turns aside to uh, Stacy and he, she, she's just like, mm, no. Her face is just like, uh-uh. <laughs> like, oh no, this movie will incite people to murder cops. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which, they, is funny, which is funny. It's because, funny that 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 whole bunch at that screening were just absolutely horrified. <laughs> I, oh my God, we can't we can't be a part of this. <laughs> yeah, but you understand, like nine eleven was just about to happen. They didn't know that, obviously. But that's right. Yeah, a couple months away. But yeah, so like right after nine eleven, anything violent was just off the table for yeah. a very for like a hot minute. And then that's why that's part of the reason why this movie took so many years to get out. But also, like, I find it ha- kind of hilarious that we they were so hung up on, you know, a cop getting shot in the head. This and but because of uh, all the unfortunate now, did things. You, that did you did you hear the police. second story about the the next distributor that he got? Because I think that's the funniest story. That's oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. oh yeah. He gets, he gets 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 a deal. He gets a deal with MGM and, and is on a talk show. Mm-hmm. And they and and they ask him about the universal thing and and then about MGM and he says, well, MGM has no morals. That's why they decided to distribute my movie. And I was like, that was the end of that deal. The next morning, yeah. <laughs> when that came out, <laughs> that no was point. all over the news. <laughs> and then Lionsgate picks it up, of course. Lion- and Lionsgate cussed him out for not. Why did you bring this to us? Because they wanted it. You know, when they I, saw they it, they were huge they in the horror. Well, not yet. They were just getting. They wanted to get into it. He's right. Yeah, they, they were, were just. Get, they were. They they were into a lot of genres, but they really wanted to explore the horror market because they'd seen what had been going on the last few years, and this one really was the first big one that they got a big cult film that they got got a hold yeah. of. And then, of course, as as you and I know that you know it, it, around two thousand, they were buying everything. Well, that's it. When did Saw come out? That was uh, one of their uh, initial ones. I can't remember when that came out. Of course, they made like now ten of them. So, yeah, I can't. I can't think when Saw came out. Two thousand and four. So the four. next. Oh, okay. That's in between this one and Devil's Rejects. Then, okay. Yep. So really, they probably already had bought Saw by the time by the time House of Cor- Corpses had just come out. Yeah, but they they really wanted to get heavy into horror, and they, and yeah. They, you know, Lionsgate was like, "Yeah, you should have brought this to us at the beginning." You know, we would have done it. Well, it's probably <laughs> because Dimension was still doing so. Uh, Bafo business. Dimension was doing a bunch. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Dementia was still raping uh, the corpse of Michael Myers at that point. Yes. <laughs> but God bless, God bless Lionsgate. They will release anything. Well, they did for a while. They, they, they've sort of backed up now. They now they're not up. buying much of anything. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, when I was really, really it, serious into filmmaking, that was the place you went to first. Yeah, they became exactly. a, a, a real studio now, so they actually yeah. don't do much uh, horror anymore. I mean, remember? Oh, no, I mean, we had you know the guy, the guy that wrote and directed The Fury, did a film here in Atlanta uh, a few years ago, and his family, he's got a family member who's a big hotshot in Lionsgate. He couldn't even get his film distributed through them. He had to go to another distributor. So I'm just like, that's his own sister wouldn't distribute his film. It was like, a good movie. So you know, that's <laughs> funny because uh, me and Ron's film got distributed by Lionsgate. I know, yeah. Jack O' Lantern. If you haven't seen it, Jack O' Lantern. I was going to say that. Jacko, that was a, it's Jack O' Lantern. Any <laughs> independent filmmaker during that time period, yeah, that they were the they were the guys. Yeah, I think we were two thousand four, actually. Yeah, Not, yeah, I they were just because I we we started a couple of films in two thousand six, and they were they were they were on our radar. Those those were the guys who we were going to. Yeah. All right, any more controversies surrounding the House of a Thousand Corpses? You oh, there's tons of them. <laughs> so, you know what I, you know what's something I, I, speaking of controversies, like, I, when I, I, you know, one of the things I'm interested in is like, what was the you know, critical reaction to it when it first came out? Not and very I, good. <laughs> I was, that's what I thought. But as I did research, there really aren't that many scathing reviews of this movie. I mean, I looked them up. They're really. No, that's like, true. No, I mean, that's here, true. Here is the worst of the worst. It's like the village, and these aren't very bad. The village voice says, straining to put his own stamp on the stale from the crypt material. Oh, he's so clever. <laughs> yeah. I hate it when critics try to be clever. It's, yeah, that's, yeah. That, anyway, I, yeah. He says, like, uh, let's see, da, 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 what else? Village voice. Oh, yeah. JoeBlow.com said, How's this? I think this is probably the worst of the worst. And it's not even that bad. Joe Blow said, House of Thousand Corpses is bad, period. I mean, not just bad, but reprehensibly so. <laughs> the movie is so god-awful that I cringe at the thought of it the way that one would when taking a deep swig of expired milk. And that is the worst review I could find. Yeah, so, well, most of them most of them were talking about the, the narrative type thing. It was just like, well, mate, you know, it just didn't make any sense to it. It was just a bunch of, you know, just a scattering of things here and there and all that. But again, I, and, and I've talked about this on Monster Attack for years. It's like the big critics, they don't get horror. They never have. They haven't gotten horror from all the way back into the 30s and the 40s. Yeah. Um, you know, just horror films, you know, and, and you look at the Academy Awards, they've never taken horror seriously except for no. up until Silence of the Lambs. Um, yeah. You know, and it's like, so I don't really pay much attention to those guys. Yeah. So, because you know, still, again, this 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 thing this thing uh, you know made its money back and more in its very first day you know of release. So you know, look at the people who are going to go see it. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's it's certainly it certainly was a building block for better things that came. Absolutely, and I, I would, and, I would uh, and and I and like I said, I was disappointed that I couldn't find a really scathing review of this movie because you would think because that's another thing. It's like Mr. Zombie is somebody who probably would have delighted in pissing off a critic so much yeah like siskel and ebert or somebody you know yeah but so uh, yeah so you know what i decided to um basically compose my own scathing review of this movie that <laughs> okay whole so here it goes my my attempt uh here it starts off <clears throat> hold on i gotta here we go Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses is a festering, pus-covered abortion of a movie. It is something once precious, conceived in the love of a horror fanboy's heart, created in the image of a rock star god, but dismembered, slathered in feces, and sucked through a vacuum hose only to be spat out in an industrial refuse heap. The filmmaking is less the product of a madman and more the product of an ADHD chronic uh, carny kid on crank. The sound is only slightly better since the soundtrack is less of a sonic abomination than Lionel Richie's post-Commodore years. We haven't even talked about what this movie does to Brick House. Oh, uh, I love that. It's a great scene. Great scene. <laughs> that somehow Rob Zombie, the musician, has managed not to putrefy Brick House. 
and a slightly memorable torture scene. But even so, Tarantino is surely sitting in his personal home theater looking at that scene when he's not looking at Uma Thurman's feet and snarks, yeah, I did that better in Reservoir Dogs. It, fa it fails to even deliver on his title since there are only a handful of corpses and a bunch of skeletons in this movie. It doesn't go far enough in some ways. It goes too far in all the wrong ways. I watched this movie on Easter Eve 2005 at Cinemax at 1230 at night, and after it was done, my soul needed a shower. The blood of Jesus covers all transgressions, but this celluloid sin should be covered in Zippo lighter butane, acid vomit, a thousand gallons of booze infested, infused, sorry, booze infused rest stop trucker urine and cast down to the lake of everlasting fire and torment. Two stars. That has got to be the greatest <laughs> review ever. And didn't even get into the whole scene with red hot pussy liquors. So, I mean, oh my gosh, God. yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> But that is the scene you could cut from the movie and nothing would it be effective. Oh, no, you can't cut that from the movie. That's just such a great scene between him, uh, between Baby and, and Goober. <laughs> All right. Uh, with well, that, I think the damage is going to be quite serious here. <laughs> with that, I'm going to bring this uh, episode to a close because I don't think anyone could top that review, actually. No, I was, but, uh, yeah, that was quite a review. Yeah. Do you have any final words on House of a Thousand Corpses from Rob Zombie? I love this film. <laughs> I do. I think it's a, I think it's a walking nightmare uh, in a good way. Um, uh, it, it, it's a roller coaster ride all the way, and I, I think it 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 launched the uh, the career of uh, a director. I think is very very intriguing, whose work I've liked ever since. Uh, but it did take two showings, you know, and again, admittedly, it took two showings for me to get really get get my wings uh, into this movie. But um, uh, it was unlike anything I had ever seen up until that point. So it sort of opened opened my world up to some other things. After this, I started getting into French horror and some of some other classics from other countries that, that I some genres that I had not not tested the waters at. So mm. I. Uh, I'm into it. I dig it. <laughs> How about you, Thomas? Anything other than the scathing but excellent review, or are you going to leave it with that? Hey, 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 no hanky-panky. Uh, I think it's... I don't know why that just jumped into my head. I think that is... Uh, maybe that is, that is that is the last thing to say, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> All right. For me, I would like to think or I like to uh, say that uh, House of a Thousand uh, House of a Thousand Corpses uh, is a movie of which I think it deserves a second viewing. Which I don't say that for a lot of movies because I actually don't watch mm -hmm. a lot of movies more than once. But I think it deserves a second viewing. Um, Rob Zombie is not a hack. He's a director who has a lot of great influences in him. And this was where it, this was a raw representation of some of those uh, great ideals and some of his raw talent, which gets uh, better with each of his subsequent films, as we've discussed with uh, Devil's Rejects, Lords of Salem, um, mm -hmm. even 30. Uh, I would give any, I would tell anyone most definitely to check out this film if you haven't. I know some people who skipped this one and only watched the Devil's Rejects, which is still weird to me. But uh, yeah, I know that's strange. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I actually am really glad I was able to watch it again. Uh, the movie sat on my shelf for years because I have, <laughs> I, I, I have every Rob Zombie film. Um, but I, this was the only one I never gave a second chance until we mm -hmm. decided to do the 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 discussion. So I would. So this one deserves a second chance. Yeah, and it's interesting that ever since, you know, after the second showing of this film, for me, now I watch it almost every time I get a chance to watch it. I watch it twice this week, getting ready for the podcast. I mean, and, you know, it's just, there's just something about this film that I, I'll see something a little different in in parts of it that is some things that I didn't catch. Some little definitely... Easter eggs here and there, uh, you know. I can definitely see this as being a Halloween movie. For sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But I would I would ask the question to all of us here is how would we rate this movie uh, and with what? I would rate this probably out of five to uh, Mermaid Boys. <laughs> out of five. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm gonna be a little bit higher than that actually, and that's yeah, me too. 
for for two reasons. One is when I rewatched it. Uh, one, I love the old Dark House, and so I love the references to the old Dark House. The second thing is, I think the uh, art direction is amazing. The cinematography, oh, God, yes. yeah. the look yeah. of this film is freaking awesome. Um, and I'm going to add third, fucking awesome soundtrack. What I can't give. Oh, back. I love that. Oh, yeah, I know. We, we didn't really get the chance to talk we much about we'll the music, to music, but discuss I it again. love the music in this movie. Music is fucking brilliant. And it all, it was, that was one brilliant thing when I originally saw it. I love the music to this film. So I'm going to give it. Four mermaid boys now. Now, if we, I, I, I agree with you. I, agree I with you, Kevin. I was thinking four out of five or three out of four, depending upon what kind of scale you're using. If if we go back to my original viewing, I would have given it a one mermaid boy. Uh, <laughs> it is now I, a much better film than I originally uh, thought, and I'm going to give it four mermaid boys. Yeah, I'd give it four. Yeah, my original viewing was, um, I don't know, <laughs> half a mermaid boy. I don't know, just like, ah, uh, just I couldn't, you know, wouldn't be able to give you anything. So, a mermaid tail, then just a mermaid, yeah, tail. but it, it jumped, it jumped considerably on the second viewing when I was actually awake and, uh, you know, <laughs> of right mind. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll convince me, I'll give it two and a half. <laughs> All right. So, with that two and a half mermaid boys. <laughs> we will bring this episode of Conversations and Horror to a close. I'd like to thank both of my guest hosts for joining me for this uh, conversation in that uh, sometimes we talk about great movies and sometimes we talk about movies we never thought were going to be somewhat great. Uh, <laughs> I hope you will join us again for another future episode. Some of our guests will be back for some of those other crazy movies and you never know what you will hear or what we will talk about on the show. So thank you all for joining us, uh, and have a good evening. Conversations in Horror is a Broken Lighthouse Pictures production, produced by Kevin L. Powers, executive produced by Kelly A. Inoka, and originally filmed via Zoom technology. Conversations in Horror is hosted by Kevin L. Powers and co-hosted by various horror film lovers and filmmakers. To learn more about Mr. Powers, please make sure to check out his Patreon page and other social media platforms. Conversations in Horror is copyright 2024, Broken Lighthouse Pictures Productions.